Greetings, Embers, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For my American audience, I hope you are stuffed to the gills with good food and lots of family time. For my subscribers that are just over the pond, I hope you've had a great day. Here in America, we celebrated Thanksgiving, if you didn't tell. <laughs> I'm stuffed, I'm full, but guess what? You still need to get that dose of vocal melatonin, along with that tryptophan from the turkey to do its job to get a really good night's rest. I'd like to thank the reformed members of the channel, Les Crispin, Tammy Slayton, CAG, Denise S, Through Scrutiny, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norman DW, Christy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's Knees. If you would like to learn how to become a member of the channel or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, those links are in the description below. Also, if you are new here and enjoy what you are hearing, or you're here and haven't done so yet, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Thanksgiving Horror Stories. Right after this intro, an ad will play. Before I start reading the first story, an ad will play because the first story is long. And after that, there's no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. The last story contains triggering language not suitable for all. This will be the only disclaimer I make in this video. The story itself may be deeply disturbing to some of you. From this point on, heavy listening discretion is advised. These stories are grouped together, so I will label them as I read, also leaving a 10 second gap in between each story. Number 1. The Barn This is a weird story that happened back when I was a teenager. My grandparents had a really small farm located in a small hollow. It wasn't a commercial farm, just something they had to support themselves. However, when they got older and it was much more difficult for them to maintain the farm, they quit using the barn. It just sort of sat there and was used as a storage area mainly. Every Thanksgiving and Christmas, we would go to our grandparents' house. This story took place on Thanksgiving. I was 15 years old, and that's the age where I began not enjoying hanging out with the adults in my family anymore. Suddenly, listening to the stories of when I was a kid or when my parents were kids was just not that entertaining anymore. We had Thanksgiving dinner early. It was about 2 p.m. Afterward, I was beginning to feel a bit antsy. I let my parents know that I was going to go and explore the hollow a little bit. It had been a while since I had done so. I didn't even think of asking my younger brother and sister if they wanted to go. It was fine because honestly, I felt like being by myself. I knew that I really didn't have a lot of time to explore before it got dark. So I set out and made sure I knew how far I could go and still get back before the sun had set. I didn't do the greatest job at it, though. If you've ever been out exploring the woods, you might probably know what I mean. You can get easily fascinated with the woods and the hills and lose track of time. It got very, very dark before I was anywhere close to being home. By the time I got back to the farm, it had been dark for at least an hour. I had never been out by the barn when it was dark outside. It looked incredibly creepy. Being a teenage boy, I of course liked scary things. The thought then occurred to me that if the barn was creepy looking on the outside, it must be really creepy on the inside. I decided to check it out. Getting into the barn was simple. My grandparents rarely locked the door of their house, much less thought about locking the barn. They lived in a really safe area where crime was pretty much unheard of. The barn did have one of those heavy wooden locks on it. I honestly have no idea what they were called, but I was able to pull the wooden beam up. When I opened the barn door, it was a horribly loud creaking noise. 
I knew my grandparents had likely not been in the barn for years, so I was surprised I was able to even get the door open at all. I figured the hinges had to be nearly rusted shut. As I mentioned, the barn was so old and even when it was in use, my grandparents would only have been in it during the day. So there was no light. Thank God that I live in the era of smartphones though, because I of course had a flashlight on my smartphone. I turned on the flashlight and just marveled at the creepiness. If in the dark it looked creepy, then just a minor amount of my light made it that much creepier. I was fascinated by all of the tools. So many sharp implements. Most of them were hanging up. However, there was a small hatchet lying on a workbench. It was discolored, and on closer inspection, I realized that it was coated in dry blood. I don't know much about slaughtering animals, but I knew that my grandparents used to do it often. Chickens and pigs and other stuff. So I figured that the hatchet was used for that purpose, and they never cleaned it. The barn had a loft that was filled with hay. I decided to climb the ladder and check it out. When I was shining the light around, it reflected off something buried in the hay. I was wondering if it was another tool or something and decided to go check it out. Going over to it, I began moving the hay. I screamed when the empty eye sockets of a long dead corpse were staring directly back at me. I fell backwards and nearly fell off the loft. I quickly climbed down the ladder and ran out of the barn without even closing the door. I rushed into the house and told my parents and grandparents about what I had just seen. My father, a huge man, think Hulk Hogan sized, really went out to confirm what I told him. My grandparents phoned the sheriff's office. The body had been in the loft for about three years. It had several hatchet wounds on it that the police told us were caused by the hatchet I had seen on the bench. The hatchet I had picked up. So not only had I found a dead body, but I held an actual murder weapon in my hand. That was truly disturbing to me. But it wasn't nearly as disturbing as the realization my grandparents had that they had lived in the house for three years without knowing a dead body was in the barn. No one was ever caught, and we to this day have no idea who killed that man and why. Number 2. Alone I thought that going to college right out of high school was intimidating. I came from a small town, went to a huge college with an enrollment of over 50,000 students. It was crazy to me how active the campus was all the time. If I thought there was a culture shock though, it was nothing compared to what happened during Thanksgiving break. I didn't have the kind of money to be able to go home, so I remained in my dorm room alone during the break. I didn't realize that this also had me one of the few people not only alone in the dorm building, but on the entire campus. What had so recently been just a metropolis of people now became a barren wasteland. If the loneliness wasn't enough, a snowstorm hit the night before Thanksgiving. I recall waking up in the morning at about 7 a.m. and looking out across a completely barren and desolate campus. Now. I suppose this doesn't seem weird at all, but it was a complete shock to me. Honestly, I spent the entire day on Wednesday in my dorm room, looking out over the campus. I didn't really even have the nerve to go out. However, I guess I began getting stir crazy on Thanksgiving. I had gotten myself a frozen turkey dinner that I was going to make in my microwave, but I really wanted to get out. There was a Denny's on campus, so I thought I would go there and have dinner. The dinner went fine, but I was uneasy because there was another guy in the restaurant who wouldn't stop staring at me. It made me uncomfortable. I normally like to take my time in a restaurant, but couldn't bring myself to do that here. So immediately after I was done, I left. Walking home, I nervously kept looking over my shoulder 
It didn't take long before I noticed that the guy was following me, and he was walking faster than I was. By the time I had gotten to the dormitory doorway, he was already up the front of the steps. He called for me to hold the door for him, but I didn't. He seemed pretty old for a person living in the dorms, but if he was a student, he would have an electronic key card to let himself in. I looked back as I went up the stairs and saw him standing in the foyer. I'm not sure how much later it was, but I heard a knocking on my door. I got up and looked out the peephole and was surprised to see the man from outside standing in front of my door. I wasn't sure how he had gotten in nor how he found my room. Rather than acknowledging him, however, I went back to my desk quietly. He knocked a few more times and then left. About five hours later, I heard another knock at the door. At first, I of course expected it to be that man again. However, when I looked out the peephole this time, it was the campus police. I let them in. One of the other students that was in my dorm building had gotten attacked earlier in the day, and they wanted to know if I had seen anything suspicious. I explained my experience to them. They had arrested a suspect, and I had to go with them to see if I could identify the person. It indeed was the man who had followed me home from the Denny's. He apparently had gone door to door knocking and hadn't known where I was. He eventually came across someone who opened their door and the person who did paid a terrible price. Number three, the parade. I want the story to be anonymous, so I'm not even going to tell you where it happened. What I do have to tell you is that the city it happened in has a really large Thanksgiving Day parade every year. I'd never been to one of them before, but I always watched it on television. I went ahead and decided to go one year. I couldn't find anyone who wanted to go with me. None of my family or friends wanted to spend Thanksgiving standing in the cold, I guess. By the time I had gotten to the parade route, it was already really packed. I was worried whether or not I would be able to see that well. I'm not particularly tall, but I was able to find a spot behind another group of people that gave me a pretty good view of the parade route. I hadn't been there very long when I noticed someone who, for some reason, just caught my eye. I can't say there was anything unusual about him, really. He was rather big, a little unkempt, but there was just something about him. I, in fact, found myself continuously looking over at him. A few times that I was looking at the man, he caught me looking. As most people do when they are caught looking at someone, I quickly looked away every time. But even so, my curiosity got me to eventually start looking in his direction again. For a while, I could tell that he was getting annoyed. I'd resolved to try harder to not look at him, but that just made it worse. After a while, I looked at the man again and noticed that he was closer to me than he had been before. I didn't think about it at first because we were in a big crowd watching a parade. People moving around in the crowd were in no way unusual, but the more I glanced over at him, the closer and closer to me he kept moving. He was doing it casually, though, making his way around other people. He was definitely coming in my direction. To test and see what he would do, I made my own way through the crowd toward the back on the sidewalk. I glanced at the man, and he immediately switched course to start coming toward me. I was convinced he was coming at me, and I was mildly alarmed. However, I kept telling myself that it wasn't anything to worry about. I was in at a parade with thousands of people. If the guy was going to try and hurt me, he would get caught pretty quickly. I guess that's the problem with assumptions, though. They really don't take all possible scenarios into account. The man did make his way over. There was only one person separating us when he stopped and went back to looking at the parade. 
I relaxed a bit, but when the man separating us moved, the guy moved up against me. I was about to move before I felt something sharp against my back. He had a knife. And probably because we were in a big crowd, he was able to hide the fact that he was holding it up against my back. To any bystanders, he looked like a guy in a crowd watching the parade. He asked me why I was staring at him over and over. I was too scared to speak at first, but then he asked me again and moved the knife. I apologized, telling him that I didn't mean to stare. I didn't know why I was looking at him. He told me that he didn't believe me, and he asked how much McMahon was paying me. I had no idea what he was talking about or who McCahon was, but he didn't believe me again. He kept pushing on that knife and told me I had better tell him the truth. I heard my voice crack and I pled to the guy to leave me alone and that I didn't know what he was talking about. I guess my words were somehow heard over the noise of the parade because two guys looked at us and then asked the guy what he was doing. I really thought he was going to just stab me then and there, but I guess he figured that he would never be able to do it and then get away in this crowd. He slipped the knife away but didn't answer the two men and took off. They didn't go after him, they just made sure I was alright. To this day, I have no idea who McMahon was, but it doesn't matter. I've been more careful to not stare at people though. Number 4. Shelter I come from a very good upbringing. My family had it very good and I never really had to be without anything. I try to give back as much as possible. I donate a lot of money to the poor and things like that. One of the things that I am the proudest of is that on Thanksgiving, I volunteer my entire day at a local homeless shelter. I try to make sure that these much less fortunate people have a good day as possible for them. I stay in the shelter overnight and leave the following morning. One of the sadder things about working in a shelter is seeing the same people there year after year. I mean, I guess seeing them makes me happy that they are not dead. But it would be nice if the majority of them were able to get themselves to a place to live and not have to live on the streets anymore. The Thanksgiving 10 years ago is one that I will never forget. There's not a lot of buildup to this story, so I'll apologize for that. The day and evening went as well as it could. There was this one guy that I had never seen before, and normally I wouldn't have even thought much about that, but he was very annoying and very rude. At one point, he even tried to take the food away from another man. Now, the rules of the shelter were that I was supposed to remove the man from the shelter for such an act. However, I couldn't bring myself to do that, not on Thanksgiving. I instead separated the two men and let the guy know that any further aggressive behavior would result in him being removed. The rest of the day and night went fine, as far as I was aware. However, at about 3 in the morning, one of the other homeless guys came into the office. He told me that one of the other sleepers had been stabbed. I ran out into the area and sure enough, the man who nearly had his food stolen had been stabbed and he was dead. I turned on the lights and searched around for the guy from dinner and he wasn't there. I checked the bathroom and the window was open. He had killed the one man and then left as quietly as he could. The most horrific part of this was a man losing his life over something as simple as a dinner. Even worse for me was that the man would likely still be alive if I had followed the rules and removed the man during dinner instead of letting him remain because it was Thanksgiving. Finally, number five, first Thanksgiving alone. I moved out of my parents' house right when I turned 18. 
Nothing against them, I just wanted to live by myself and live in the city. I got myself a small studio apartment in Chicago. I had to work both the day before and the day after Thanksgiving that year, so I wasn't able to go home. Instead, I had a lonely day at home in my own apartment. I'd never cooked a Thanksgiving dinner before and really don't think that I needed that much food, so I just got myself a big TV dinner. I really hadn't realized how lonely I would actually be though. In fact, the loneliness was so overwhelming that I also began getting cabin fever. I think in actuality, I just wanted to be around other people. So after I had eaten my TV dinner, I went out and went for a walk. It was cold outside and there weren't a lot of people out. Since I had moved to the city, it was the first time I had not seen literally swarms of people everywhere. I walked around on the street by the bars, but knew I wouldn't be able to get into any of them. I was out for quite a while before I decided I just wanted to go back to my apartment and be warm. So I headed back. When I got to the apartment, I put the key into the lock. I opened the door and went in. My apartment was a studio, and the only other room it had in it was a bathroom. Having walked around the city for a couple of hours and not having gone into any buildings, I really had to go to the bathroom. I always kept the bathroom door closed. I went in and didn't turn on the light. I just used the light from the rest of the house. When I was peeing, I got the strangest feeling. I felt very uncomfortable and like someone may have been watching me. My bathroom, strangely enough, had a window in it. It was actually on the wall of the shower, so I turned to look out the window and expected to see a bird or something. Instead, I came eye to eye with the form of a person behind a translucent shower curtain. It was a person, and he was looking directly at me. Startled, I fell backward. He opened the shower curtain. I scurried backward out of the bathroom. I made it to my feet and went for the door. However, before I got out, I felt the man grab me from behind. I struggled, but all he did was take me and throw me across the room. He then left the apartment and the door slammed behind him. I got up as quickly as I could and locked the door. I then phoned the police. It didn't do any good, really. I noticed several items from my apartment were missing. Apparently, the guy was a burglar and didn't expect me to come back. I just caught him in the act, and he likely wasn't intending on harming me specifically. Growing up, my family never had a great Thanksgiving. For us, those fateful Thursdays in November weren't times of reunions and lavish dinners. They were times of sadness, just another lonely holiday for the Birch family. Then again, we never had a chance. My mother died during childbirth when she had me. I honestly believe my father Sam always resented me for it. Somehow, I think his warped mind even blamed me. We all lived in Colquitt, Georgia, it was a quiet little town. There was just me, Daddy, and my older brother, Brandon. Brandon was three years older than me and, like myself, was also a pale ginger. We were equally scrawny and vulnerable. My family was middle class, but it certainly didn't feel like it. After all, Dad hardly ever spent time with me and Brandon. He never complimented us, never encouraged us. Every night, Dad would get home from the mill well after 10. He'd spend those extra hours not working overtime but downing beer over at Moby Dick's Bar and Grill. At just 10 years old, Brandon did all he could to take care of me, but we were young. Our suppers were anything more than whatever frozen TV dinners we could find, but we still bonded. We'd watch cartoons together, play board games. He even helped me with my homework. Brandon was mature for his age. Ultimately, he became the parent neither one of us ever had. When we were together, the house became our sanctuary from Daddy and the outside world. 
We also had all those framed pictures of Mama hanging on the walls. They made us feel safe, like she was always watching over us. But in these circumstances, we didn't have a chance. Kids couldn't watch kids. With no mother and essentially no father, the Birch family was destined to end in tragedy. Especially once Daddy came home. That's when our imaginary playland turned into a real-life horror. Sam was an abusive alcoholic. By the time he got home, his buzz would have turned into a bitter rage. And the brunt of his anger went toward Brandon. Not because Daddy didn't want to hurt me, but because Brandon made sure he didn't. He stood up to Sam. Along with his maturity, Brandon protected me with the passion of a caring mother. On those horrible long nights, Daddy would take Brandon to the bedroom with him. I'd be left there on the couch, alone in our dark living room, trapped in this modest house that always felt darker and colder than it ever should have been. I looked toward Mama's pictures for support, for comfort, but with her gone, she couldn't console me. Only Brandon could. Maybe I was too young to suffer from Daddy's wrath, but unfortunately for Brandon, he was old enough to understand our abuse and mistreatment, and he was old enough to endure it. I never asked Brandon what went on behind those closed doors, but even as a child, I had a sinking feeling that I didn't want to know. During one of Daddy's drunken Thanksgivings, Brandon had finally had enough. Daddy had forced me out of the kitchen and made me watch TV. He told me to just focus on Scooby-Doo. Don't worry about him or Brandon. And whatever I did, don't go in the kitchen. He told me Brandon was going to be punished for being a bad boy. Just thinking of those words now sent chills down my spine. Not to mention, they were the last words Daddy ever said to me. To this day, I still don't really know how it all went down. I have no idea how my 10-year-old red-headed brother grabbed the knife and stabbed Sam over 15 times in his face and neck, or why Brandon was found naked, caught red-handed holding the bloody knife, his nude body covered in so much blood his hair had turned into an even darker red. In the kitchen, the police found Daddy's slaughtered naked corpse, desecrated beyond belief. Daddy with his penis severed, his ass literally shredded to pieces. Needless to say, our TV dinner feast had gone untouched. With so much blood on it, our food looked like it had been covered in a thick crimson sauce. And I was right where I was told I needed to be, in the living room. My young eyes glued to the Scooby-Doo marathon. I had been too scared to dare peep into the kitchen. And looking back, maybe I saved myself from further trauma by doing so. They took Brandon away, and I was sent to live with my mom's sister in Tallahassee. I should have been there all along. Aunt Sue had a gorgeous home, and unlike Dad, she wasn't a miserable alcoholic. She had life and compassion, and she cared about me, not to mention she actually celebrated holidays. She made them fun, and yes, those Thanksgivings with her were glorious. The polar opposite of the hell Sam had put Brandon and I through. My years with Aunt Sue became the soothing shelter from the stifling storm that was my life with Sam. She helped me through everything, she was there for me for my graduation from FSU and my marriage to Randy. She was there for me when I went from being Victoria Burt to Victoria Flowers, lead paralegal at Radica Incorporated. I was successful, yeah, but I wouldn't have made it this far without Aunt Sue. I wouldn't have become this confident or ambitious. I wouldn't have met Randy. I wouldn't have my handsome six-year-old son, Lee, or beautiful three-year-old daughter, Anne. I wouldn't have my life as it is now. I'd gone from being a mistreated little girl in Colquitt, Georgia, to a pretty and wealthy upper-middle-class mother in Florida's state capital. A path that made me the Hallmark movie company drool. 
but deep down, I knew I wouldn't have made it this far without Brandon, both with his support growing up and with the way he freed us through brutal violence. Over the years, I did my best to reach out to Brandon. I'd go see him in Jacksonville when I could. He'd even call me sometimes. But our conversations were always stilted and awkward. Nothing organic like it was when we were kids. Then again, I suppose that's normal. Nonetheless, I still loved him, and I knew he was getting the best treatment he could. I made damn sure of that. From what I understand, he was doing pretty well. The doctors just said he suffered outbursts and fits of rage from time to time due to the trauma Sam had inflicted upon him. But overall, he was doing much better. One of these days, I figured Brandon would come back to see me when his mind was clear, when he was ready to leave Jacksonville Mental Health Center. Then we'd be a happy family again, and for the first time in his life, he'd get to celebrate all those holidays with me. For now, I had this year's Thanksgiving to worry about. I always made sure us flowers did it big. Countless decorations, an excellent home-cooked dinner, pilgrim and turkey figurines everywhere, pumpkins on the front porch, Lee's Thanksgiving-themed school crafts stuck on our fridge. This was going to be a holiday Lee and Ann would always look back on with fondness. I suppose I had extra motivation due to my miserable upbringing with Sam. My festive motivation about the only nice thing that asshole ever passed on to me. That and the red hair, I guess. On Thanksgiving morning, me and Anne were cooking in the kitchen. I'd been prepping since around 7 a.m., like a band getting ready for a sellout crowd. Only this crowd was so much more important. My family. As in me, Randy, and the kids. Yeah, there'd been no in-laws or nothing like that coming over. But the stress was still all too real. The Flowers family Thanksgiving had to be a success. If I was a freak about it, so be it. It was Thanksgiving, goddammit. I had the food arranged on the long counter. The dressing, the corn, the beans, and yes, a huge uncooked turkey. At three years old, Anne was little more than a cheerleader for me, albeit an adorable one. She had Randy's dark hair and my attitude, a little baby fat that didn't keep her from looking any less cute. Like much of our items in this new house, I had plenty of great appliances to aid me in this festive feast. Besides, I liked having Anne as my right-hand man anyway. This was the same type of kitchen bonding Aunt Sue and I had done all those years back. Pushing through the swinging doors leading into the dining room, Randy and Lee enter the kitchen. Randy was dressed in a thin jacket and shorts. I couldn't blame him since this would be yet another warm Thanksgiving. With those cheekbones and combed over hair though, he was definitely rocking a classy DILF look. Then again, he was a paralegal, like me. He knew how to rock that professional yet smoking hot appearance. But behind the superficial shit, he was still so caring and understanding. He'd even gone with me to visit Brandon a few times. Hey, how's it going, babe? He asked. We're on track for noon, I said. Just in time for kickoff. We exchanged a quick kiss. I looked over to see Lee and Ann staring at all the food in wonderment, like they were at Disney World all over again. Hell, the turkey hadn't even been cooked yet, and they were already drooling. Then again, the damn thing looked to be the size of them. Jesus, was I cooking a pterodactyl? Just a few more hours, I told them. Lee looked at me with his bright eyes. He had my ginger hair, and yes, Randy's laid-back demeanor. Can we have some candy? Yeah, Ann shouted. Grinning, Randy rubbed Lee's hair. Let's get that pumpkin pie first. Yay, pumpkin pie, Ann yelled. Overexcited, she ran laps around the kitchen. Thank God I haven't given her candy yet. Okay, Lee said to Randy. You're just going to the gas station, right? I asked my husband. Randy smiled. Yeah, I'll be right back. 
He gave me a kiss. I love you. As he turned toward Lee, I snuck in a quick slap on Randy's firm ass. I couldn't resist. I love you too, I told him. I leaned down and gave Lee a kiss on the head. I'll have dinner ready soon, okay? The turkey too? He asked. Yes, the turkey, I promise. Full of joy, he kissed my cheek. I love you, mama. I love you too, baby. Wrapping his arm around Lee, Randy led him off toward the living room. Bye, baby, Randy said to me. Okay, I said. I saw Anne run into one of Randy's legs during her frenetic jog. I couldn't help but smile. Chuckling, Randy gave Anne a kiss before letting her continue on. Anne picked up right where she left off, her mouth the roaring engine, her feet the ferocious tires, the kitchen her racetrack. Thanksgiving morning, you can't beat it. Until Christmas, that is. Thirty minutes later, I had the turkey in the oven. I was now off kitchen patrol. Together in the living room, Anne and I watched a Scooby-Doo marathon. A hallway loomed right behind us, as did a flawless staircase. The show didn't resurrect any traumatic memories for me, given how clean my house was and how huge our flat screen was compared to Sam's bulky piece of shit. Um, the comparisons between the past and now ended with a cartoon dog. My life was at a new place, and Anne's early years were going to be reflective of how Aunt Sue raised me, not how my dirtbag father did. As Anne stayed enraptured by Scooby in the game, I kept checking my phone. Randy wasn't replying to my texts. Restless, I looked over at the nearby front door. I was hoping to see Lee and Randy stagger in at any second but they never did. Anne's laughter drew my attention back to her. I stood up off the couch and caressed her shoulder. I'm going to go check on the turkey. Just right, right here, Anne. Like an addict, Anne's eyes stayed glued to the screen. Uh, okay. Her hand rummaged through the bag of dumb, dumb lollipops lying at her side. She wasn't going anywhere. Clutching my phone, I walked into the kitchen. The turkey was still cooking to perfection. I got ready to call Randy and see what was taking so long. Right before I could mash the call button, a steady knock distracted me. Startled, I looked toward the doorway leading into the living room. More knocking from the front door echoed toward me. Uh, someone's at the door, Mommy, I heard Anne yell. I'll get it, I replied. As another knock rapped on the wooden door, I walked through the living room, right past Anne and Scooby-Doo. Stopping near the door, I looked out the window. I saw our driveway, the eloquent neighborhood running right behind it. But on my front porch stood a man I hadn't seen in months. A man I hadn't seen on Thanksgiving Day in over 20 years. Brandon. His frame was more slender than ever. His hair redder than ever. In all those years, he still looked the same, just taller. Handsome but haggard by all the stress of an abusive father and a long stay in a mental hospital. But still, he looked nice, even in his ragged jean jacket and ugly khakis. I could tell he was fidgeting, not from our non-existent cool weather, but from understandable nerves. He was avoiding eye contact with the door and windows, as if he could tell I was looking at him. Who was that, Mommy? I heard Anne ask. Caught off guard, I looked back at her. Um, just someone Mommy knows, baby. My eyes drifted back to the front door. At first, I hesitated. Then I realized this would be our very first holiday together. I mean, this was my older brother, home for the holidays. His next calm knock startled me from my thoughts and worries. My emotions won the internal debate. I took a deep breath and opened the door. Outside, Brandon greeted me with an awkward smile, but he wasn't forcing it like he did at Jacksonville. There was bittersweet emotion in his expression. Hey, sis, 
Brandon said in his typical dry tone. Oh my God, I said, smiling. I gave him a big hug. Gentle, he hugged me back, awkward as always. How are you? God, I don't believe it. I leaned back and just looked at his grin, his bright eyes. Brandon Birch was here in the flesh, back with me. And fuck, he was skinnier than ever, like a skeleton with a red wig. When'd you get out? Like a gawky teenager, Brandon shrugged his shoulders. Yesterday, they said I was good to go. His smile grew even wider. So I figured, why not come here and see you on Thanksgiving? It's a Thanksgiving miracle, I teased. Brandon chuckled. Struggling with my conflicted emotions, I paused for a moment. Listen, Brandon, I'm sorry I didn't see you last month. Brandon gave a dismissive wave. No, I understand. I got busy with the kids, the Culkin case. With a soft touch, Brandon caressed my shoulder. It's okay, sis, he smiled. You've got your own life to worry about. I understand. Thanks. Taking a step back, Brandon motioned toward the neighborhood. But I'm sorry for dropping by like this. No, it's fine. If you want me to go, I can, Brandon said. Aunt Sue said she'd take care of me. Chuckling, I grabbed his arm. <laughs> no, that's ridiculous. It's Thanksgiving, man. Um, you sure? Yes. Empathetic, I led Brandon inside. Come on, we've got plenty of food. Sweet. Inside, Brandon was awestruck by the picture-perfect house. With the hospital walls and doctors removed, our bond felt stronger than ever. Like we were children again. We joked and reminisced. Maybe having Scooby-Doo on helped. Brandon and Ann hit it off as well. She even gave him a dum-dum. Brandon hadn't lost his ability to relate to children. Even when Dad took his innocence, no one could ever take away Brandon's youthful spirit. We left Ann back in the living room in her Scooby-Doo vortex. In the kitchen, Brandon and I managed to catch up on old times. Aside from the occasional stutter or reckless ticks, Brandon looked comfortable. The most comfortable I'd ever seen him, actually. I think he was more excited than anything to have Thanksgiving dinner with us. It'd be the first time he'd ever have a feast with people he loved, he told me. Given how well Brandon and Randy got along, I knew Randy wouldn't mind. Shit, the way Brandon helped me prepare the food, I wouldn't mind if Brandon stayed here for a few more months. Nothing like an extra helping hand around the house. Working together, we placed all the plates and silverware on the dining room table. Yeah, I'd help them with the food sometimes, Brandon said about his stay in Jacksonville. Oh, really? I said. Yeah. He straightened out one of his plates. His perfectionist tendencies would probably never go away. I figured. Obsessive tendencies. I never wanted to eat it, though. Brandon said with a smile. It was nothing like this. I never smelt food that smelled this good. I chuckled. <laughs> well, you know how Aunt Sue is. I like to think she taught me well. Oh, for sure. With careful precision, he laid down the last knife. He nodded away the kitchen. I couldn't help but notice that turkey, though. He's fucking huge. Grinning, I put back another bowl. I got the biggest one I could find. Man, Brandon exclaimed. That's like one of them Christmas carol turkeys. Laughing, I started to lead him back toward the kitchen. I always wanted to have one of those, Brandon added. In the kitchen, Brandon walked over to the oven. This is what I always wanted, you know. Amused, I watched him steal another peek at the turkey. He was worse than the kids, or a hangry Randy for that matter. A Thanksgiving with just me and you, Brandon went on. 
He closed the oven lid and grinned at me. Like the dinner we should have always had. I nodded. I know. Uneasy, I watched Brandon stop right in front of me. Lost in my reflections, I struggled to get my words out. I'm sorry, I finally said. I'm sorry about what happened. About Dad. My eyes looked to the floor. Calm, Brandon ran his hand along my arm. Hey, sis. I looked into his bright eyes. We're here now, all right? That's all that matters. You know, fighting off the melancholy, I looked over at the food. They were the delicious delicacies me nor Brandon ever got to enjoy in our youth. Such luxury Brandon hadn't experienced his entire life. Let's enjoy the now, sis. Brandon caressed my cheek, making me look at his warm smile. Like an avalanche, my nostalgia swept over me. I love you, I said to Brandon. Without hesitation, I gave him a hug. A genuine, heartfelt hug. I could feel Brandon's arms frozen in place, but I didn't care. I figured he was confused, not used to the affection. I love you too, I heard him say in a dry mumble. That monotone he'd had since childhood. As if my love had melted his stoic awkwardness. I felt Brandon's hands collide against my back completing our warm embrace. I'm just glad you're home, I said to him. He squeezed my back a little tighter than I expected. I am too, he muttered. His grip only tightened, but I could still breathe, but I couldn't break free of his grasp, even if I wanted to. This is our Thanksgiving, sis, Brandon mumbled, his voice drier than a bored juvenile delinquent's. Regardless of his odd behavior, I didn't panic. He was my brother, after all. Mama! Anne yelled from the other room. Like he was struck by a taser, Brandon let go and took a startled step back. Playing off the weird encounter, I looked toward the doorway. Are you okay, Anne? Come here, Mama! Anne called to me. I better go see, I said to Brandon. He let out a nervous chuckle. I faced him. You want to watch TV with us? With compulsive ferocity, he shrugged me off. Nah. He looked at the food. I can actually just watch the turkey if you want. I gave him a confused look. Uh, are you sure? Yeah, positive. Like a confident top chef, he walked over toward the oven. I'll take care of everything. Mom, Anne hollered in her most obnoxious, pleading voice yet. Like a sugar-filled kid you'd hear screaming in the audience for a children's show. That's my girl. Pulled away by Anne's demands, I stumbled toward the living room. All right, thank you, Brandon. Brandon leaned in toward the oven. No problem. Mama, come here, Anne yelled. I'm coming, honey. I responded. There was no emergency in the living room, just a concerned three-year-old who'd forgotten her mama was less than 50 feet away. I comforted Anne on the couch, with a little help from Scooby-Doo and Candy, of course. We watched a few episodes of the marathon. All the while, I kept hearing movement in the kitchen. I figured Brandon was fine. I gave him a holler here and there, but he kept responding he was okay. Maybe I was being naive, but I trusted him. Fuck it, I was kind of tired too. I'd been doing Thanksgiving shit all morning long. Randy never helped much in the kitchen. Needless to say, the kids didn't either. I guess it was kind of nice having an assistant chef for once. Even one who'd just been released from a mental hospital. I texted Randy. Where are you? A few minutes went by and I still hadn't gotten a reply. Trying to calm my lingering anxiety, I look over at Anne. Her eyes were all on the cartoon. A lollipop in her small hand. Not a care in the world on her face. I was never that tranquil at her age. That innocent. Brandon and I never were. Dinner's ready, Brandon yelled from the kitchen. 
like his voice was the snap of a hypnotist's fingers. Anne leaped off the couch and ran toward the kitchen. So excited, she left Scooby and the dum-dums all behind. Chuckling, I followed after her. <laughs> that was quick. Yeah, I heard Brandon say. My phone vibrated. Propelled by hope, I stopped and checked it. The unsaved number dashed my hopes quicker than that queasy feeling you get when you drink too much. All I could tell was it was a Florida number, but I knew it wasn't Randy. Dejected, I rejected the call. Were telemarketers really calling on Thanksgiving now? You ready? I heard Brandon tease Ann. Yeah, Ann squealed with enthusiasm. Nervous, I looked over at the TV. The game was about to start at any second, as was dinner. Wouldn't Randy had called by now if he was running late, or at least respond to my texts? Victoria, Brandon said from the kitchen. Mommy, Anne shouted with glee. Their chorus drew me away from the living room, a temporary distraction from my restless unease. I entered the kitchen and walked past the closed oven. The dining room was set up perfectly. There was all the dressing and veggies, the mashed potatoes, sweet tea, and positioned like a shrine at the center of the table was the large turkey. Brandon had done a great job. Impressed, I stared at the mill. Wow. Brandon pulled out a chair for me, one right next to Anne. Thank you, I said. No problem, sis, he replied as I took my seat. I looked over at Anne's wide grin. She was so cute and ready to eat. A few feet away from us, Brandon sat at one end of the table. So hopefully the turkey's done, he said. Grinning, I looked at the turkey. Somehow it looked even bigger than I remembered. Did it grow while in the oven? Of course, the gravy only made it look all the more appetizing. Yeah, I say so. My phone buzzed, startling me from my salivating sight. I left it in there a little longer than you wanted, Brandon said. I checked my phone. A voicemail from that same number awaited me. If it was Randy, he would have just texted me, I figured. He knew I don't answer weird-ass numbers. One of the tricks I learned back in the hospital, Brandon went on. In a state of confused silence, I faced him, like he was the therapist. Brandon gave me a worried look. What's wrong, Victoria? Nothing, I said in an unconvincing tone. Even Anne was looking right at me. I saw the confusion in her young eyes. Are you going to eat, Mama? I didn't even answer my own daughter. My eyes drifted over to all the food. Here it was Thanksgiving, a holiday I'd been prepping for. A holiday that was going to be enshrined in the Flowers family memory banks forever. And yet, I felt weird. Uncomfortable. Brandon was here. But everything was so incomplete without Randy and Lee. Are you okay? Brandon asked me, concerned. Doing my best to downplay my unease, I look over at Brandon. Uh, yeah, I'm fine. I, I just haven't heard anything from Randy. Oh, I'm sure he's fine. But they've been gone all morning. Nonchalant, Brandon slid a bowl of mashed potatoes over toward the excited Anne. Maybe he's going to surprise you. Maybe, I contemplated the idea. I suppose Lee may have talked him into getting a Christmas tree, like she was digging into treasure, and started dumping the potatoes all over her plate. Trying to reassure me, Brandon flashed me a smile. After all, it is Thanksgiving. I forced a smirk. Yeah, you're probably right. I slid my phone back in my pocket. The food distracted my gaze for the time being. I'm sure Randy and Lee wouldn't object to me partaking in the meal without them. After all, Brandon was here. The three of us began eating. Anne never complained. Not that she had 
time since she was shoveling so much food down her mouth. I tried to get her to slow down, but Brandon convinced me to not worry about it. Just let her enjoy it, he'd joke. Thanksgiving only comes once a year. Brandon had a point. Maybe I should just fucking relax and enjoy the food. At one point, Lee and Randy would come dragging their asses in. Then together, all of us would enjoy the night. Our first Thanksgiving with Brandon. My family finally reunited. Soon enough, we moved on to the turkey. I was going to let Brandon have the honors of cutting it and taking the first piece. After all, he'd worked pretty hard setting the table and making sure the bird didn't explode in the oven. But he insisted I do it. The turkey was tough to cut into. After a few hard slices, I finally managed to get a couple of large cuts, and it was delicious. The best turkey I'd ever had, in fact. For all the shit this meat gets, and rightfully so, I'd never had it any juicier or tastier. Sure, the sauce and dressing helped as well, but the meat wasn't dry. The turkey had a natural flavor, an exotic tinge of something else, like the whole thing was really soft steak. With eager delight, both Brandon and Ann dug into their cuts. You like it? Brandon asked me. Judging by his shit-eating grin, I knew he'd seen how much I was enjoying it. I must have looked like a kid eating their first chocolate bar. All the gravy on my face, like smeared chocolate. I swallowed a piece. Mmm, mmm, mmm. It's excellent. Good, good, Brandon said. He took another bite. He damn sure chewed it with relish. Delicious. Enjoying the good mood, I exchanged smiles with Anne. With the sudden gesture of a spoon tapping a wine glass, I heard Brandon throw his silverware onto his plate. The shrill, screeching noise made me and Ann look right at him. Such a great dinner, Brandon said to me, his dry tone sounding more sardonic than chill. He locked his bright eyes with me. It's a shame we never got to have this with Dad. Suspicious, I kept my gaze on him. Brandon's smile was sly and just as calculating as his tone. I know, I replied, keeping my voice steady. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Ann grab another piece of turkey. Of course, we know the real reason why, Brandon said. A cold smirk crossed his lips. I mean, it's no wonder we never celebrated it together. You know, just me, you, and Dad. What are you talking about, Brandon? I asked in a soft tone. I didn't know where this was going, so I avoided being too confrontational. Plus, I knew what Brandon was capable of. A scowl overtook Brandon's smile. All those years, he never hurt you. You never knew the things he did. The shit he did to me. For a moment, I thought tears were going to flow from Brandon's eyes, but they never did. Instead, his harsh glare remained in place. Then I realized Brandon no longer had the emotional capabilities to even shed a single tear. God knows he'd forgotten how to give a hug. Teardrops had become as foreign as affection to him, like Sam had ultimately made Brandon in his image, a soulless being. Like a bit of royal, Brandon sent back in his seat, you just let him do those things to me. You didn't care. Brandon, I'm sorry, but I couldn't do anything, I pleaded. I couldn't stop him. That's bullshit. Concerned, I look over at my daughter. She'd stop eating, always a sign she was scared. Anne just stared at me with frightened, wide eyes. And unlike Brandon, she was on the verge of tears. I grabbed her shoulder in a soothing grip. It's okay, sweetie, I said, doing my best to disguise my own fear. Brandon slammed his fist on the table, 
the sheer force rattling all the dishes like an earthquake had struck. No, it's not, he yelled. Helpless, Anne began to cry. I wrapped my arm around her and kissed her forehead. It's okay, sweetie. With irate energy, Brandon pointed at Anne. You want to know what your mama did, huh? Brandon, stop it, I yelled. Like a psychotic preacher, Brandon leaned in even closer. He was less than a foot away from us and oh so close to Anne. She let our father fuck me, Brandon yelled. Horrified, I gripped my arms tighter around my precious Anne. Oh God, I said in anguish. Brandon cackled, not a joyous chuckle, but a guttural laugh from a jaded and cynical soul. Yeah, that's fucking right. She didn't even try to stop him either. He hit the table many times in furious succession. She let him fucking rape me, he screamed. Stop it, Brandon, I pleaded. She didn't give a shit about me, Brandon went on. There was no tears or cathartic release for him. Just this brutal rant. Sweat drenched his face. His glowering eyes sliced us like colorful blades. She let him rape me every night. Every fucking night. I couldn't do anything, I yelled at Brandon. I couldn't fight him. Like Anne, I too couldn't keep the teardrops from sliding down my face. Bullshit, Brandon hurled back at me. Behind the tears, I glared at him. I couldn't, Brandon. You know that. I was too young. I didn't know what to do. Full of rage, Brandon slapped the table once more. I felt the hit shake the entire table. I thought he even broke it. One more hit, and he surely would have. No, Brandon shouted. You killed me. No, I said. Brandon, please. You killed everything I had, Brandon went on. He snatched the knife off his plate. Now, I'm going to do to you what you did to me. Terrified, I watched Brandon stand up. Put that down, Brandon, I yelled. Brandon, please. Brandon pointed the knife at us. I'm taking her away. He marked Ann with the sharp blade. Just like I got daddy. I heard Ann's terrified cries. They were shrill and helpless. No sound a parent would ever want to hear. Acting on motherly instinct, I cradled Ann against me. No! I yelled at Brandon. God damn it, listen to me, Brandon. We didn't do anything to you. In a vicious taunt, Brandon waved the knife back and forth. But you didn't do enough, sis. He pointed the weapon at Anne. My daughter's tormented screams ravaged my soul. They were a torturous soundtrack. Now I'm going to kill her. Like I killed dad, Brandon continued. I'm going to slaughter her like a goddamn turkey. Brandon, I started. Brandon's horrifying war cry interrupted me. Like a mad killer, like the boy everyone found in Sam's kitchen over 20 years ago, he raised the knife and came charging towards us. Acting fast, I pushed the table forward. The wooden edge battered Brandon in the balls. Yelling, he cringed in pain and staggered back. Stay right here, baby, I commanded Anne. I gave her a kiss on her pretty head before grabbing my plate and rushing toward Brandon. Holding his crotch, Brandon glared at me. Before he could raise the knife, I smashed the plate over his head. Brandon felt back against the wall. The knife slipped from his grasp. Fuck! He yelled. Disoriented, he hit the floor. Gravy from the plate covered his face like makeup. I picked up the knife. What are you going to do, <laughs> huh? Brandon hurled at me. He sat up, his intense eyes focused on me. <laughs> You're going to kill me? 
You've already done that, sis. Breathing heavy, I looked over at Anne. She had her eyes closed and her hands over her ears, shielding herself from the horrors before her. Much like I did at her age when I buried my horror in those cartoons. Victoria! Brandon cried out with a wild rage. Turning, I saw him lunge up and run toward me. His movements fueled my uncontrollable anger. Like a reflex, I raised the knife, sinking the blade straight into my brother's heart. The final time I'd ever heard him. Brandon collapsed in my arms. Like hot water, I could feel his warm blood pouring over my hands and clothes. But I still held on to him for dear life. Behind dying eyes, Brandon faced me. Redness seeped from his mouth, blood redder than our hair. He never once shed a tear, even while I wept before him. <laughs> I'm sorry, Brandon, I said with sympathetic softness. Brandon's blank expression never changed. <laughs> Happy Thanksgiving, sis, he struggled to say. Enjoy the turkey. He flashed me a quick smile. Comforting Brandon in his last moments, I returned a weak smile, the least I could do considering he was my older brother, the same brother who'd taken care of me all those years. I watched Brandon die in my arms. His bright eyes remained forever open, his mouth still agape, but his body was completely still. Still crying, I gave him one final kiss on the forehead. Then, I laid him out on the dining room floor. Like my past, my clothes and skin were drenched in my brother's blood. Morose, I looked down at Brandon's corpse. Mommy, I heard Anne say to me in a timid voice. I looked over to see Anne standing right beside me. Her tear-filled eyes stared up at me. She looked as helpless as I did that Thanksgiving Sam was killed, the day my family was forever torn apart. I love you, sweetie, I told Anne. With a firm touch, I hugged her close. I love you. The swinging doors burst open with ferocity. Victoria, a voice yelled at me. Startled, me and Anne saw Randy stagger in. He was no longer my classy, handsome husband. Instead, he had cuts and bruises all over him, his breaths heavy, his steps weak. Blood doused his dark hair and leaked all the way down his face. Oh my God, Randy, I yelled. Clinging to Anne's hand, I ran over and helped Randy lean against the table. I saw places of duct tape still stuck to his wrists spots where he'd been bound and gagged. What happened? What's wrong, Daddy? Annie said through tears. It's... It's your brother, Randy said to me between breath. He, he attacked me? Oh, God. Horrified, I looked back at Brandon's corpse. I, I got a phone call, Randy went on. He grabbed my shoulder, making me face him. Listen, the hospital called. They said he broke out. No, I said in terror. In my mind, I realized that had to be the number, the one that left me the voicemail. Hey, they were trying to warn us, Randy continued. They got cops everywhere looking for him. I snatched my husband's arm. Where's Lee? I demanded. Ugh, I don't know, Randy replied. What do you mean? Nervous, Randy's eyes scanned the room in desperate search of our son. He took, uh, he took him from me, then he threw me in the trunk. What? No. I grabbed Randy by the shoulders. Even hearing Anne's agonizing screams and sobs, I kept my focus on Randy, my panic focus. What happened? Where is he, Randy? Your brother took him. 
He took him somewhere. Where? With the desperate despair of a helpless mother, I let go of Randy and looked all around the dining room. I didn't see him. He didn't have him. Randy looked toward the table. I didn't hear another word from him. Aside from Anne's crying, I heard nothing, as if all life had left the dining room. Facing Randy, I saw his horrified eyes looking on at the table. Randy! But he said nothing. I realized his face was now a disturbing shade of white. His mouth quivered, but nothing came out, and tears poured from his eyes, gallons of them. I followed his petrified gaze, and I saw what had disturbed my husband. I saw what would forever haunt me. The turkey now leaked blood, more blood than such a bird could ever hold. Like blood seeping through the bottom of the door, the crimson all poured out in droves beneath the turkey, in an endless red stream. Tears fell from my eyes. No, I said. I grabbed Anne and pulled her in close. I had to guard her, especially since she was the only child I had left. Enjoy the turkey. My brother's final words were more than an attempt at dark humor. They described the terrifying memento he'd left behind, the fulfillment of his twisted legacy. I realized his revenge was never about killing me or Anne. He wanted his flowers doppelganger, the elder brother, Lee. With the turkey now half eaten, I saw it for what it really was, a thoroughly cooked human torso, the torso of a young child, my son. Not even the gravy could hide the soft, fleshy skin at this point not to mention the scattered bits of red hair masquerading as seasoning. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Thanksgiving horror stories. If you are resting or sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you are awake... I hope you've enjoyed this truly disturbing selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.